Um, we've got two very, very eminent speakers. Um, on my left is Professor Catherine Barnard, who is um, Professor of EU Law at Cambridge at Trinity College, uh, has been a very important spokesperson, if I can say this, on legal issues relating to Brexit, and has shed um, a lot of light on what is still a very opaque subject, even for us lawyers that practice in the field of EU law. Um, she has an extremely long list of publications, and I was just saying to her that her book on the substantive law of the EU, which is now in its fifth edition, is um, more or less a Bible for those of us who practice in the field. Um, on my right is Martha Spurrier, who is um, the Director of Liberty and has been um, Director of Liberty for just over a year now. Um, before her appointment, she had a human rights practice at Doughty Street, and now, of course, Liberty is playing an important part in um, forming um, policy and debate surrounding Brexit and other areas in which Liberty is very active at the moment are technology and human rights and um, immigration and human rights. Those are the three um, big topics at the moment that Martha is um, directing at Liberty. Um, so with no further ado from me, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Barnard first, who will be followed by Martha Spurrier, and then we will hopefully have a lively debate and questions. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for those kind words, and thank you very much for inviting me here. I was asked to talk about rights um, and enforcement, and I'm going to talk a bit about that in the light uh, not just of the withdrawal bill but also um, in the light of the uh, government's paper position paper on enforcement and dispute resolution and actually because i really struggled to try and think this through and um, i'm going to talk a bit about it through the context primarily of citizens rights given that they are the ones who are going to be um, at the forefront of uh, the changes both being introduced um, by any uh, divorce agreement and also in respect of any withdrawal deal going forward. So the basic tension is well known. Theresa May declared um, in her Lancaster House speech that we will take back control of our laws and bring to an end the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. Uh, the EU has taken a rather different view, particularly in the field of citizens' rights, and basically has said uh, we've got to protect the citizens' rights, they've got to be granted as directly enforceable rights, and I'll come back to that term in a moment, basically for the lifetime of the EU citizens that have moved, so potentially for up to a period of about 100 years, if you look at the, the babies who were born uh, shortly before we leave the European Union, and the full force of EU regulatory compliance. Now will be applied the Commission and the Court of Justice. So you've got very much um, a dialogue of the deaf there, and that dialogue has not been improved, at least at first sight, by the enforcement um, and dispute resolution, resolution um, paper. You may have a nuance there that now it's talking about will bring to an end the direct jurisdiction um, of the Court of Justice. Um, but of course, all the talk about bringing an end to the direct jurisdiction of the Court of Justice um, is fine if we were going to pull up the drawbridge entirely. But what we see is that we are looking for a very close relationship with the EU, and the closer the relationship with the EU, the harder it is to divorce yourself from the Court of Justice's case law. <laughs> Certainly that's the Swiss experience. The Swiss experience was that you needed um, agreement of the Swiss Supreme Court before any ECJ decision had effect in Switzerland. Uh, that proved absolutely impossible to manage, and so the Swiss Supreme Court basically said in 2009, uh, Swiss courts have just got to apply ECJ case law as if it were um, case law of the Swiss courts. So we know from practical experience it's all very well to say nothing to do with the ECJ gov, but in fact um, it will um, um, ECJ case law will carry on applying in various forms, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, one of the things that the 
um, enforcement paper does is to distinguish between, on the one hand, enforcement of rights, which is basically my subject for today, and separately and secondly, dispute resolution. So enforcement is primarily about individuals and companies, I'm going to focus on individuals, enforcing the rights under the agreement. Dispute resolution is about dispute between UK and the EU, so essentially at state level. Now, as far as enforcement is concerned, you've got the statement that there should be uh, this, um, whatever is agreed going forward should maximise certainty for individuals and ensure that they can effectively enforce their rights. Now, for those of you who aren't lawyers um, in the room, I just want to just explain very briefly about the current position about enforcement of rights um, in order so that you can see what the potential options might be. And rather than talk about it in the abstract, let's just think about a case, a, a potential case that could perhaps have arisen so the Home Office sent 100 letters out very recently saying to um, a bunch of folk, including um, a very distinguished Finnish academic, that um, she needed to get out within the month. And then the question is, if it hadn't all blown up in the press and the Home Office hadn't realised that they'd made a terrible mistake, what happens if she had brought a case before the courts? Now, at present, what she would do, she would take a case, I won't get into the technicalities of where, but we'll just say she would bring the case in the National Court. She would rely on the direct effect of EU rights, which means she would take her EU rights and say that she's got the right to be here. She would rely on those directly effective rights in the British courts. And the British courts may well say, actually, yes, she's right, and will uphold her EU rights to stay. And because EU law trumps national law, doctrine of supremacy, therefore the two doctrines, direct effect and supremacy, wrapped up in one. Now, if the British courts weren't clear what EU law actually meant on that point, they could make a reference to the Court of Justice. And it was a reference to the Court of Justice, and the Court of Justice would interpret what EU law meant, and then the case would come back to the National Court to apply it to the facts of um, our Finnish academics case. And in fact, what we see here is an effective and pretty robust enforcement um, system. But as you can see, supremacy and direct effect absolutely go hand in hand in the system as we've got at present. Now, of course, all of this gives you the opportunity to ask questions of the Court of Justice. And just to be clear for those of you who aren't lawyers, not to be confused with the Court of Human Rights. Um, I think most lawyers in this room have had a pound for every time they've had to explain the difference. Um, would be on a Caribbean island, or perhaps not on a Caribbean island at the moment, but would be on a Caribbean <laughs> island not talking about Brexit. But anyway, we're talking about the Court of Justice, not talking about um, the Court of Human Rights. Now, the robustness of this system is backed up by the fact that there's an effective reme remedial system. So if our Finnish academic has been deported, she suffered loss, she would get damages. Uh, damages would have to be effective. She would get damages against the state. If the state doesn't make provision for damages, she could go for state liability, Frankovich. Uh, she could go for an injunction, she could go for a declaration. All of that's there. And if that doesn't convince you that actually the system at the moment for protecting individuals is quite robust. I summarise here the good things. As you can see, the advantage of the system at the moment is that you start in your local court. You don't have to start in some foreign court. So it can all be done locally. You can also see um, that the litigation is initiated by the individual. You're not dependent, she's not dependent on the Finnish government bringing a case on her behalf. The remedies are beneficial to her as the individual. It's not some sort of remedy based on retaliation by the Finns against the UK government and suspension of the agreement. So the system at the moment um, does deliver a very effective um, remedy to the individual citizen, citizen who has been denied her rights. And if she doesn't want to litigate because she doesn't fancy her chances, doesn't like the idea of going to court, she can complain to the Commission and the Commission can bring Article 258 proceedings against the UK if it chooses to do so. And it's a discretionary mechanism. 
And if the UK proves to be obstinate, uh, eventually the matter can go to the court again and the UK can be fined for non-compliance. Or she can have the attractive and very simple mechanism called Solvit, which is not well known in this country, but it's an informal dispute resolution mechanism which the Commission has set up for individuals um, who want to get things sorted out in informally um, between the individual and the state. So that's the situation at present. What I want to think about now is the effect of the withdrawal bill and what might be possible going forward. Now, we all know, and you've heard from far more informed people than I this morning about the implications of the withdrawal bill. We know, first of all, that the European Communities Act is being repealed, and with it, Section 2.1. And Section 2.1, in a very opaque way, gives effect to the principles of supremacy and direct effect. We also know that the Article 267 reference procedure is going as well. It's not one of the treaty provisions that's been saved. And of course, it's a matter of uh, politics that the UK um, will not be subject to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. And the Article 267 reference, of course, would go directly contrary to that. So it looks like for our Finnish academic going forward, she's going to be in a bit of a bad way. So let's just think what um, might happen. What are the possibilities going forward? And this is where I want to focus particularly on the enforcement and dispute resolution position paper. Well, that paper says very clearly there's going to be essentially what I call a Brexit package. There's going to be the withdrawal agreement, which will be of direct interest to our citizens who are already here. There's going to be probably some sort of transitional deal. And thirdly, there is going to be um, a, a, an agreement, hopefully, on some sort of final trade deal, which may have protection of rights of um, EU citizens going forward. So there is going to be this Brexit package and the question is, what will the legal effect of these agreements be in the UK system? And specifically, what about individuals who want to rely on them? Now, we know these agreements will be agreements under international law. And the UK is what's called a dualist legal system. So we will have to transpose those agreements into UK law through an Act of Parliament. So there will be a withdrawal agreement Act of Parliament giving effect to the withdrawal deal. And then the question is, what legal status will that Act of Parliament have? Will it have some special constitutional status in the same way as the European Communities Act and the Human Rights Act already have? And if so, does it mean that the content of that should take precedence in some way over anything else in domestic law? Now, you've got those three um, potential deals. What does the paper say about dispute resolution and enforcement? I will briefly dwell on dispute resolution, even though it's not really what I'm talking about. Um, the reason I'm mentioning the dispute resolution limb, remember that's the dispute between, if there's a dispute between the UK and the EU, and there might be a dispute between the UK and the EU over the three things which are identified in the paper, namely implementation, UK isn't sticking to its side of the deal, or subsequent actions taken by the UK, or increasing divergence um, between um, what we agreed and um, the content of the deal. The paper then spends quite a lot of time looking at the various options for dealing with dispute resolution. And there's a nice Cook's tour in a very few number of pages, a nice Cook's tour of the alternatives that you find um, across the world um, of um, whether you use some sort of political mechanism, a joint committee, as you do find in the EEA, whether there might be some sort of arbitration, consultation leading to some formal arrangement, more general monitoring and reporting. So quite a lot of thought has been given to the various options that can go on the table for dispute resolution. And, as I say, a number of pages in quite a short document spend quite a lot of time thinking about that. But in respect of enforcement, in respect of enforcement, there's only a couple of paragraphs. So enforcement, that's what about 
individual citizens? What about citizens who uh, want to enforce their rights? And what it says on enforcement is that the UK's position is that where the withdrawal agreement or future relationship agreement between the UK and the EU intended to give rise to rights or obligations for individuals, then where appropriate, these will be given effect in UK law. Those rights or obligations will be enforced by UK courts and ultimately by the UK Supreme Courts. And UK individuals will also get the same protection in other systems. <coughs> of course, what's missing here is any explanation as to how, how it is that UK nationals will be able to enforce their rights in the, uh, in the French courts, for example, or whether it might be not even in the French courts. There is, of course, no reference to those killer terms, direct effect, and supremacy, because clearly if I'm going to, if, a, if the Finnish national is trying to enforce her rights in the British courts, there's got to be a hierarchy of norms. And if British courts can only respect British law, and if British law says that British law is hierarchically superior, then a Finnish national is not going to be able to um, bring her claim successfully. And of course, the EU is acutely conscious of the Miller problem. The EU has read the Miller judgment and they know about the fact that in Miller you've got a very clear statement about the sovereignty of Parliament. <coughs> what happens if, even if we comply with the terms of the withdrawal agreement today, there is a new government tomorrow that, apps, that reverses that agreement and does not respect the terms of the agreement. Of course, there will be implications at international level, but at domestic level, our Finnish national is going to be left high and dry. And so that's one of the reasons why they are um, so concerned about what might be in terms of remedies. Now, again, let's go back to our Finnish national and see if we can work through the situation. You remember I talked to you about the situation before, how she would enforce her rights in the national court, and any questions would get referred to the Court of Justice. Let's think about what she might do post-Brexit. So we've got the Home Office sending her an unjustified, unwarranted letter deporting her. Now... She could challenge that administrative decision. She could challenge it in the British courts. And if it looks like you've got a decision maker who's gone off on a frolic of their own, that right could be enforced in the British courts. The British courts would uphold British law and say, in a judicial review action, that um, the Home Office was in breach of their <coughs> legal obligations under UK law. That is straightforward, and that clearly is what was being envisaged by the statement there that she can enforce her rights in the British courts. What's more difficult is it's, if it's not a Home Office decision maker off on a frolic on their own, but it's UK law itself which is divergent. So, for example, the requirement of the withdrawal agreement says you can only deport someone who's done five years if they are a seriously serious threat to public policy. And UK law sets the bar much lower. The UK law says, well, you can deport anyone um, who is potentially a threat to public policy. So you've got a divergence between the two rules. <coughs> the question then is, how does she challenge that? How is it going to work going forward? Now, here, this is where the um, dispute resolution paper doesn't address this particular problem. So let's walk through, and I think there are four options. No doubt you can think of many others, but I think when we've done four, you might have had enough. But the first one is she, obviously she would start by taking a case to the UK court. And one argument, the simple way of doing it, is to say UK court must interpret UK law in the light of the withdrawal agreement, as British courts do in respect to a number of agreements. And it may well be that if you have a favor favorably disposed court, the court says, yeah, OK, we will interpret the light of the international obligations, that higher threshold, and essentially respect that higher <coughs> threshold and therefore allow her to enforce her rights. Remedies, much less clear. Damages, well, Frankovich has gone under the withdrawal bill, so the remedies issue might be less clear. But let's say the British court... Um, really um, doesn't want to bend UK law as far as it might have to in order to give her the outcome she wants. 
what else can she do in that situation? Well, one possibility would be she then goes to the Finnish government and says to the Finnish government, look what the UK are doing, look how they're treating one of your nationals in the UK, and lobby the F Finnish government to start dispute resolution proceedings, or at least lobby the EU to start dispute resolution proceedings against us. Not exactly an effective remedy for her. It will take forever. Lots of discretion built into the system. She's got to persuade the Finnish government to intervene and the EU to intervene, and something's got to be sorted out at that level. It's not going to give her um, many rights. So that, that route doesn't look like a very effective enforcement mechanism. Um, another possibility is that um, she challenges the case um, in the, the Briggs case in the National Court. Uh, the case starts in the National Court, and then the National Court, because it's not sure, wants to ask some external body what the withdrawal agreement might mean. Now, this looks very like the Article 267 reference procedure, but of course we know that that can't be used. So does that mean we need to set up some other dispute settlement body, which might look rather like the EFTA court? Now, again, the government blows somewhat hot and cold about the EFTA court. David Davis seems to have ruled it out in his, what he said last week. But certainly the EFTA court... Um, and Carl Baldenbacher, who's the president of the EFTA court, is very much pressing the EFTA court as a good mechanism for us. And the advantage from a political point of view about references to the EFTA court is, one, they are not mandatory. 267 references are mandatory by the court of last resort. References to the um, EFTA court aren't mandatory. <coughs> Secondly, they are not binding on the national court that has made the reference. Um, and thirdly, contrary to um, the arguments made by people like Martin Howe that the EFTA court slavishly follows the ECJ, it does not always slavishly follow the ECJ. And if you want to follow up on that, there's an interesting blog by Karl Baldenbacher on the LSE website um, where it sets out the areas where the EFTA court has diverged um, from the ECJ. So that might be a possibility to go to the EFTA court itself or to go set up some other court that can enforce the rights. So the third possibility is our Finnish academic goes to the national court, the national court says, no, we're applying national law, you've got no rights, um, thank you and goodbye. So then the other possibility is to think maybe in that situation um, she then makes an independent claim before a newly established body, and this rather follows the an investor state dispute settlement approach, that you get nowhere in your national court, in the national court, because the national court is hostile, so you go to, if it's an investment dispute, um, an ISDS arbitration body to enforce your rights. That might be another possibility. Um, the fourth possibility is to say... Um, actually, when Parliament, if it approves the withdrawal um, agreement or the future deal, when it's implementing um, that into UK law, remember that international deal will need to be converted into UK law by an Act of Parliament, that the Act of Parliament gives special status to the withdrawal agreement, and that withdrawal agreement, essentially, not in terms but recognises that the contents of the withdrawal agreement must take precedence in the case of conflict. It won't be used in the language of supremacy and direct effect, not least because of the um, political um, implications of using that language. But, again, look at the EEA agreement. EEA agreement does not have direct effect, does not have supremacy, but in practice... EEA law trumps domestic law where national courts are prepared to do that. And it seems to me, going forward, this might be uh, one possibility if we don't decide to go down the full EFTA court route. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Okay, I'm going to cover 
just some reflections on the human rights position, as you'd expect, given where I work, um, and where we are at the moment with the withdrawal bill and the question which I think we were talking earlier about the fact that it doesn't appear in the media very much but does seem to be a real concern for a lot of people about whether or not Brexit means a diminishing in human rights protection for people in the UK. So there are really two areas and I'm going to focus mainly on the substantive protections that are derived from the Charter and the ways in which we could ensure that those protections remain in UK law going forward. But the so there's a, there's a question about substantive rights protection and the need for non-retrogression of rights protection and equality protection going forward. And there are a number of groups, Liberty included, calling for a black and white clause in the withdrawal bill that commits this government and future governments, hopefully, to not regressing on human rights protections in the UK. But the second issue is around parliamentary scrutiny. And as you all know, and has no doubt been discussed already today, the withdrawal bill creates pretty breathtakingly permissive and wide-ranging secondary legislation powers. And there is no prohibition at present against those secondary legislation powers being used to amend, modify, or reduce human rights and equality protection. So the Human Rights Act it itself is ring-fenced in the bill. But of course, human rights are not only derived from the Human Rights Act. There are countless other pieces of legislation where you might derive rights and equality protections. And those may be at risk if the wide-ranging Henry VIII powers continue in the form that they're currently in in the bill. But I want to, we can come back to that perhaps in the Q&A if it's of interest, but I wanted to focus more on the charter and the position that we find ourselves in. So again, for the non-lawyers in the room, or the lawyers that don't practice in EU law, the Charter is a treaty which the EU has acceded to, and it is made up of a number of different sources that provide rights protection in areas of EU law. And it contains within it a number of rights which are not found elsewhere. So it's not, for example, a mirror image of the European Convention on Human Rights. It's not a mirror image of the Domestic Human Rights Act. Many people talk about the fact that the Charter didn't per se create new justiciable human rights. I think that in itself is debatable. But in any event, because the Charter is linked to the European Court, and the European Court is a purposive court, the rights in the Charter have been given a much more, in, in many cases, a more expansive definition than perhaps their black and white text would have indicated, and that we would be able to derive from the Convention and the Human Rights Act. Just as a footnote, you may be aware that there is a protocol to the Charter which purports to limit the extent to which it applies in the UK and also in Poland. Although, to summarise what has been a very fraught debate, effectively it doesn't have any impact at all. Um, and just to give you a flavour of, of that, Mr Justice Mostyn, um, in the case of NS, was reflecting on the Charter and reflecting on its magnitude and on the protocol. And what he said was, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union contains, I believe, all those missing parts, that is, all the missing parts of the Convention that we did not incorporate into the Human Rights Act, and a great deal more. Notwithstanding the endeavours of our political representatives at Lisbon, it would seem that the much wider Charter of Rights is now part of our domestic law, and moreover, that much wider Charter of Rights would remain part of our domestic law, even if the Human Rights Act were repealed. So, I think we can take as read that it applies here regardless of the protocol, and that there are areas in which it goes above and beyond what the European Convention can offer people when they are bringing a case about human rights or seeking to rely on their rights protection. It also has a much stronger enforcement mechanism, of course, because if a case, if a case is successful under the Charter, then the piece of legislation, say, that's being challenged can be disapplied. And that happened recently in the case of Walker and Innispec, which was a liberty case. And again, I'll come back to it in a little bit more detail. But in that case, a man called John Walker brought a challenge to an opt-out in the Equality Act, a piece of domestic legislation, which prevented his partner, his husband, from accessing the same pension rights that he would have been able to access had he been a heterosexual couple, were they a heterosexual couple. <clears throat> and the Supreme Court has disapplied that part of the Equality Act on the basis that it is contrary to the general principle of non-discrimination under EU law. That's an example of where the Convention wouldn't have been able to return such a muscular remedy for Mr Walker, and nor would domestic law. 
There are many other areas where the Charter adds something above and beyond the Convention, and I think a particularly interesting one to think about, and particularly interesting at the moment because there is a lot in the news all the time about tech and privacy, but also because the GDPR, which is the, the new European standard on data protection and privacy, comes into force next year. Digital rights are something that the CJEU, using the Charter, has really moved very progressively and, and been streets ahead of many domestic courts across Europe, but also the European Convention. So, for example, in Digital Rights Ireland, which was the first in a line of cases, the Court of Justice held that the Data Retention Directive was invalid because bulk collection of personal telecommunications was an infringement of fundamental human rights. Bulk collection of those kinds of communications, of course, are one of the powers that is brought into force by our Investigatory Powers Act, which received royal assent towards the end of last year, and is currently being challenged by Liberty using EU law. Another of the cases, of course, was Schwenz, which many of you will know about, which was where the, the safe harbour agreement between the United States and the EU, which concerned the transfer of personal data between two states, between two jurisdictions, didn't provide adequate safeguards for privacy protections. And then the very well-known case of Google Spain, which was about the right to be forgotten. All of those cases are charter cases. And there is not the jurisprudence in the domestic courts and nor in the European Court of Human Rights to run those kinds of cases now on behalf of individuals seeking to enforce their privacy rights. There are many, many other areas where the Charter has forged the way in progressive human rights jurisprudence. And just to give you some examples, one is in relation to bioethics, one is in relation to the rights of the elderly, which goes much further in the Charter than there's no mention in the Convention. Similarly, disability rights are much more textured and muscular in the Charter. The Charter contains a hard-edged right to legal aid, Many of the challenges to Chris Grayling's raft of legal aid cuts were brought using Article 47 of the Charter, which gave individuals that right to legal aid and equality of arms before the law. So where are we now in terms of the Charter and the Withdrawal Bill, and where might we go? So the Withdrawal Bill is absolutely clear in black and white that the Charter of Fundamental Rights will not be part of domestic law on exit day. <clears throat> And the justification that the government have given for that is that the rights in the Charter are not needed because they exist elsewhere. And I think, as I've just indicated, that's just simply not true. At worst, it's a misunderstanding, and at worst, it's a sleight of hand, probably, and at best, it's a misunderstanding. Um, what is also important is that there is no clear entrenchment of the general principles of EU law that the Charter seeks to codify in many areas, but again doesn't incorporate in their entirety, which again can give rise to hard-edged rights protection for individuals. So, for example, there are principles of EU law in relation to non-discrimination and equality. That is the principle that John Walker relied on in the Innispec case, and that is the principle that the Supreme Court used to disapply that pernicious section of the Equality Act. Other of the fundamental principles of the general principles include fundamental human rights as a general point, the principle of proportionality, legitimate expectation, the right to an effective remedy, rights of defence, transparency and rights to access of documents. So a whole raft of rights which give individuals a powerful tool to ensure access to justice when they're seeking to enforce their rights. So, the difficulty at the moment, and I think it's fair to say it's not clear what the status is of the general principles under the Withdrawal Bill, but when you read all the clauses together, it looks very much as though, even if they still apply as persuasive, and I think that's a fairly optimistic reading, but even if they still apply as persuasive, they do not give rise to a justiciable cause of action for the individual. So as the bill is currently drafted, you would not be able to rely on the general principle of non-discrimination on the day that we leave the European Union, even if that principle is in some way contained in, UK, in domestic law, and even if you have been subject, like Mr Walker was, to an act of outright discrimination. That, as you can imagine, is something that Liberty and other human rights groups are very closely focusing on at the moment, and what we are asking for is a clause in the bill which makes it clear that there is a right of action, 
arising from the Charter of Fundamental Rights, where those rights are engaged by the EU law that continues to be retained. Now, there are parts of the Charter that only apply to things like the functioning of the EU. Now, of course, those will no longer be relevant, so you would need to disapply those. So you would need an elegant, elegant way of wording a situation where you were taking some parts of the Charter, but not the parts that properly stayed within the EU when we left it behind. The other problem, of course, and it's related to the problem of jurisprudence that has been raging really since the Brexit debate started, is what do you do about the case law of the Charter? Do you say we incorporate the Charter rights and then we hand them to the domestic courts to interpret and enforce, thereby giving rise to the spectre of a divergence between our Supreme Court and the Court of Justice of the European Union? Or do we again need some kind of mechanism whereby the Charter rights that might continue to be incorporated in our UK law keep pace with or don't diverge from the Court, the court of Justice's jurisprudence? I think there are different ways that you can argue it. On balance, I would say that the Court of Justice has been a more progressive court than our domestic courts in terms of human rights pr protections. But having said that, recent decisions of the Supreme Court do indicate that there are times when our Supreme Court is willing to be very bold indeed, and the Walker case is one example, and to use human rights protections, to find those human rights protections, often even if it means going back to Magna Carta, and to return a strong and progressive result for the individual. So I think that's a question that is begged if you start to argue that some of the charter rights do need to continue to apply and that the general principles need to continue to apply because otherwise there will be a material loss in rights protection, then you also need to start having the conversation about what is going to be the effect of the ongoing jurisprudence. But what is absolutely clear, and as I said at the beginning, is that at the moment there is no guarantee of non-regression on human rights and that it is not good enough for the government to say that we don't need the Charter because we can find all the rights within it elsewhere in our domestic law. They are simply not there. There's then, of course, a whole other conversation about where this leaves the Human Rights Act and the European Court of Human Rights and that debate, which is on the back burner, but of course I think will we'll come back round almost certainly in two years' time. Um, and that, again, I think we can leave for the Q&A if people are interested in talking about the relationship politically, at least, between those two things. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much for those um, fascinating and thought-provoking presentations. Um, I, hope, I hope that the audience will indulge me if I make a couple of observations first before opening it out to questions. Um, the, first, the first observation I had, um, Catherine, was on um, what you were saying about enforcement of the withdrawal treaty and rights of EU citizens living in the UK. And um, I completely understand your point about um, the fact that the EU are very worried about what you call the Miller problem, sovereignty, because obviously this, this answer that the UK government's given, which is, um, well, this all can be enforced through UK law, presupposes that it will be transposed properly into UK law and will remain transposed in that way and not repealed or amended by a future government. And one of the... One of the questions or observations I had when you were talking about potential solutions, and in particular the EFTA court, is um, well, what, what happens if, um, a, as you say, you're challenging not the act of the administration, an act of the administration, but the UK transposition of the withdrawal treaty? So let's say it applies a lower standard than, than what's expected. And let's say um, the EFTA court solution is adopted and you have a reference and the EFTA court says, well, UK law is wrong because it's incorrectly transposed, but it's not binding. What, what's the domestic court then supposed to do on um, receipt of the answer? Because presumably, given that there's no supremacy anymore, um, it would need express parliamentary powers, wouldn't it, to set aside the, the, the domestic statute? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's right. But I would say that the way it seems to work in the, um, EFTAS, or in the EEA system is that the National Court is not obliged to follow, but because of the Norwegian obligations towards the EEA of homogeneity, they do try and apply it. There is a, a well-known case called STX, where the Court of uh, the EFTA court gave um, a ruling on posted workers that the Norwegian court didn't like at all. 
and said the Norwegian court had just the Norwegian court said the EFTA court has just failed to understand our labour market. And so they said we'll apply points A, B and C of the judgment, but we won't apply points D because the EFTA court's just got it wrong. And um, there was much cheering in Norway and it showed that you know our courts are independent. But actually what's happened since is that the uh, Norwegian employers um, who were disadvantaged by the Norwegian court's response complained to the EFTA surveillance mm. authority and they've, they're following it up. Mm. So I would be lying if I said, you know, it's all absolutely tickety-boo and it mm. doesn't matter that the Norwegian courts don't apply that ruling because there are consequences. Mm. Um, does anyone have any kind of follow-up questions on that particular point before... Um, I mean, the, the, the one well, over I have here. A, I have a little question about the mutual agreement and uh, how the mutual agreement actually works from an EU perspective. Uh, there have been papers in the last few days about whether the withdrawal agreement should comply with the rural rule as a matter of EU rule. So you've got legitimate expectation, you've got uh, legal certainty. So we are in a very complex situation because, I mean, if the withdrawal agreement has to comply with EU law, and I would say it does. I think that's right. Uh, and the ECJ will have to review the, the withdrawal agreement on the basis that it does, otherwise it will not be binding on the EU. Uh, we would have to ensure that legal certainty, and going back to your, the case of the Finnish professor, you know, is actually the legal certainty of his, of him staying in the UK and exercising his treaty rights, continuing to exercise treaty rights if the Maduro agreement provides so, will have to be maintained. Mm -hmm. So how do we practically, uh, as, we're wrong, it's impossible to give an answer, mm -hmm. but how do we provide for those rights to be preserved, because otherwise the withdrawal agreement would be void as a matter of EU law. And at the same time, the withdrawal agreement has to <coughs> be consistent, let's say, with the Miller case, so that part of is sovereign supremacy and so on. Rights have, rights have to give in, and you know, I don't see anybody doing it. It, it, no, it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating question. I, I certainly agree with your first point very much that, of course, the withdrawal agreement will be s subject to um, EU law and to the, ter to the terms of EU law, general principles of EU law, of proportionality, non-retroactivity, legitimate expectations, legal certainty. But then, of course, none of these principles are, are absolute in the sense that... You know, they, that, that and then you're, you're absolutely right. You, then it becomes more political, I think, than legal about how you actually square the circle. That, of course, Article 50 is about a state leaving the EU, and so by definition, a state leaving the EU means that they will no longer be subject to um, EU law. Now we've got no track record of this because it's never happened. So, um, so I realise my answer is extremely woolly um, because I, because the answer is I don't think I don't, I don't know. As you may know, I think Fouché is actually on this specific point is a third leading to the council in July, which I mean, had to start on this specific point. So we will probably we'll know what we have to do. So when the Soviet Union broke up, I mean the Baltic states are the Eastern Europe uh, European countries that they don't they didn't sort of surrender sovereignty over the Russian citizens who were left behind in their territory to the Russian courts. Now sort of Britain is becoming free of the EU. Why should EU citizens here uh, you know, have, have the privilege of having their rights enforced by uh, the European court? I mean, it's, it's the same, that's my... But isn't, isn't the question that, um, obviously agreement needs to be reached on the withdrawal agreement, and so as, as you just said, the withdrawal agreements going to have to respect EU law and, and represent, well, it's going to have to re represent a compromise, a political compromise but between the two sides. So once that's agreed, so once that's agreed, then it's going to have to be enforced because obviously the EU is not going to sign up to something which, just, which has no guarantee of being implemented. That's the political issue, I think, it seems to me, because if the, if the EU signs up 
to an, to, to an agreement which substantively is to both the EU and the UK's satisfaction, but then um, it, it's, it's then transposed into domestic law as it has to be because we have a dualist system, so it's not going to be directly applicable in our courts, and it's transposed incorrectly or on day two, there's a change of government who decides actually these rights we've given to EU citizens we don't like, so we're going to completely negate. I mean, that's what, that's politically what the EU is going to want to make sure doesn't happen at the outset. Whatever happens, Article 50 has been triggered, and that's, that's, the, that's the deadline. So this withdrawal bill is neither here or, here or there as far as that Article 50 goes. Well, I'm not that's, sure that's I understand that, because I think my point is more of a political point, which is that the EU, presumably, is not going to be happy agreeing um, a, a, a withdrawal, agreeing to um, making a withdrawal agreement that has no prospect of being enforced or complied with. It's a unilateral process by the UK. OK, let's move it on. This so, so turn on his head, what happens at a future IGC if the EU decides? So sorry, if the EU then decides to do what? Do you well, know if the EU decides to extend the rights enjoyed by EU citizens as EU citizens in the United States, it's, it's, it's analogous, isn't it? It's either way, if we have no control over their politics and the way that they have no control over that, it's, 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 well, we're talking now about the specific issue of EU citizens living in the UK post-Brexit. I think what you're talking about is something different. Well, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking, well, I'm talking about EU citizens living here as well. If, if the withdrawal agreement says yes. that you insist that basically EU citizens have to continue to enjoy the rights they enjoy under the new law, and the ECJ is ultimately the arbitrary that, if via a treaty change, the EU changes the nature of its law, Ah, I see the point you're making. Well, then that's obviously in the same way that, I've, that, that I suspect that, um, well, more than suspect, that an agreement that simply leaves to the English courts enforcement is not going to be palatable to the EU, then I would assume that an agreement that leaves things at large to the EU is not going to be palatable for the UK government. Vested rights, if you're pointing. I'm sorry? Vested rights yes. is the key to it. Mm -hmm. If the agreement is about vested rights, it's as now. Yeah. It doesn't open the door no. to changing the No, that's right. I have a question for Catherine, actually, about the Clause 9 of the withdrawal bill, which was subject to much discussion in the reading of the House of Commons last week. And Clause 9 one says, a Minister of the Crown made by regulations make such provision as the Minister considers appropriate for the purposes of implementing the withdrawal agreement if the minister considers such provision should be enforced on before exiting. Um, and the rest of clause 9 basically includes the Henry VIII clause. I, I wonder, do you see that impacting on anything that you were saying about citizens' rights? Because you were talking about um, an act of parliament implementing the withdrawal agreement. But this foresees that a minister using a, a regulation can do all sorts of things um, before exit day that can have a considerable impact on citizens. Um, so could that be factored into any of your discussion? Yeah, I think, I think that's helpful. And I must say, I was very struck when I read that clause um, when, the, when the, bill was, the bill was published. Um, I, mean, I think I, I understood and I, I expect that the actual agreement itself Will not the, the Article 50 <coughs> agreement will actually be subject to an act of Parliament rather rather than it just being it being sort of shuffled through via um, the secondary part. But I, I, I mean I can see that Clause 9 could be read so bro broadly as to in include that. But I, I do take this point, and this is perhaps where we then start um, looking at doctrines like acquired rights, um, under which obviously you've written a, a lot uh, and helpfully on. I mean I absolutely agree with you that there's nothing no such thing as acquired rights under Article, Article 70 of the Vienna Convention. But you might be able to wriggle it through in customary international law. And certainly, I think there's an argument under EU law that acquired rights has got some status as a general principle. But even still, we're on quite weak legal 
territory in order to say actually we can really guarantee that um, citizens' rights will be protected. And so that takes us back to the political dimension of what will get what will be a, a, a palatable on both sides. I wanted to um, move on to the issues that Martha was um, discussing, which are separate from rights conferred by the withdrawal agreement and really relate to rights which are conferred by EU law now and what will happen to them post-Brexit, and um, make a couple of observations which relate to Martha's presentation. So Martha focused on the Charter fundamental rights, and um, I was looking as she spoke at... um, some of the clauses of the withdrawal bill. And of course, lots of EU law rights, um, uh, Martha mentioned the the Walker case in the Supreme Court, um, stem stem not not from the Charter, but from directives or regulations or other, other instruments of EU law. And what's interesting, of course, is that clause four of the withdrawal bill, um, which um, provides that rights recognised immediately before exit day are to be enforced and continue on and after exit day, has an exception, which is um, at subparagraph 2, um, which states 2B, which states that that doesn't apply to any rights which arise under an EU directive and are not of a kind recognised by the European Court or any court or tribunal in the UK in a case decided before exit day. And so that appears to me to give rise to some um, potential arbitrariness because it may be that you have a directive which confers an extremely obvious right that's not been the subject of litigation ever because no litigation's needed because the right is just so blindingly obvious that there's no court or judgment pontificating on it. Well, that would no longer be a right which is to be enjoyed after exit day. Um, Whereas by contrast, there may be a much more um, tenuous right which has been recognised by the European Court because it was controversial, which just because there happens to have been a judgment on it now can be enforced after exit day. So that's one... Uh, potential oddity that I, um, I, I noticed as, as Martha was speaking about the bill. Um, and then similarly, um, if you focus on the schedule and Schedule 1, uh, there's this provision about no general principle of EU law being part of domestic law on or after exit day if it wasn't recognised as a general principle by the court, the European court. And then equally, under paragraph two, there's no right of action in domestic law based on a failure to comply with any of the general principles. And so one wonders then, how about these cases that have taken place based on directives? And I'm thinking about cases like the Kukuk de Vecchi case on age discrimination, where the judgment of the European court... Um, vindicated a right, in that case the right to um, redundancy calculations not based on, uh, not tainted by age discrimination, but the judgment was based not only on the provisions of the directive but also on general principles. What happens then? So you've got a judgment recognising a right under a directive, so that seems to be okay under clause 4.2b, but the judgment is part of the reasoning, is based on a general principle which is now not enforceable. So that seems to be another issue which, you know, if the bill is passed in this form, is, it would be ripe for uh, litigation. Um, so th- those are just, uh, as well as the Charter of Fundamental Right issues, those are just, uh, I think, additional issues which are at the moment ambiguous and which, on one reading, limit the enforceability of rights which are supposed to remain in place post, um, post-exit day. If anyone has any questions or observations on that kind of issue, which was, uh, which was addressed by Martha in her presentation. I've silenced everyone into... <laughs> 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 that was the UK, well, that's, that's one of the kind of potential political implications, is that, and I think one of the fears was, before the manifestos were published just before the election, that the Conservative Party would say, because of Brexit, we're going to be throwing everything up in the air, so the best thing to do is repeal the Human Rights Act, pull out of the Convention, and finally have our British Bill of Rights. And I think that there is a real prospect that that will be something that is, at least in the political minds of the Conservative Party, whether it becomes a political possibility in a couple of years' time, I don't know. Um, Of course, I think that would lead to 
a very regressive rights agenda because there is no single Conservative Party politician on record saying that a British Bill of Rights would extend rights protection. Um, and so I think what would be very dangerous then is it would open up a, a serious agenda of dim, diminish, diminishing rights. Um, and But I, I think it is absolutely right to say that it was one of our real fears and it was a relief to see that the Convention and the Human Rights Act were protected in the manifesto for this election so that there has been some separation between those two issues, which I think is helpful in the minds of the public as well, um, because it will make some advocacy around that a bit easier when, it, when the time comes. Over there, thanks. Just a response to your point about the you found the situation. I think, as you said, the directive um, for certain issues that are relevant to the subject of the judgment that the directive is quite a so. Um, and I think that clause 4 to the connection should be read, but the reference to the of the kind, because it's scope to argue that it actually captures directly effective rights and directives that satisfy the criteria for direct effect, whether or not the CJD has actually uh, found that to be a position in the case. So on your second point about where the general principles are going, um, I think the answer must be that they would remain relevant in that kind of situation in that they form part of the retained body of law that the domestic courts can have reference to when they're construing that uh, retained EU law, which would include a provision of a directive that the courts would approve law scores. So I think perhaps uh, the, the, the bill operates slightly more uh, generously than the EU suggested. It, I mean, that may well be right. I just don't think it's clear on its face. Um, also, I find the, the words are of a, not of a kind. So the um, not of a kind recognised by the European Court. I mean, again, that's capable of being read more or less broadly or narrowly. And so um, does that mean if you've got a directive which provides a non a sort of right say, a right to um, protection against age discrimination has been recognised, can someone come along and say, well, actually, under the same directive, I'm claiming a right to protect me against sexual orientation discrimination under the same directive, and that hasn't been recognised so specifically by the European Court or by domestic court, but it's of the same kind, and so it's okay. So do you, do you define it as discrimination, or do, is it narrower? And again, I think that's the kind of question that will give rise to, may well give rise to litigation if the bill is passed in this form. Um, well, of course, yeah. It, yes, potentially. I mean, any, any, um, any change, any legislative change has the potential for spawning litigation, and this undoubtedly will, um, whatever form it's passed in, because these are very complex legal and constitutional issues, which are novel, because we've never been in this situation before. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question or observation, and then uh, before moving on to the last session, does anyone have anything they want to ask or add? Okay, one here. Do you anticipate that if we do adopt the most generous uh, facilitation of the convention, don't we, don't we leave ourselves open in the future to constant clashes between the sensibilities of English or common or English and Welsh common law judges and our parliament and say a, a European uh, community which seems to have more generous, uh, uh, generous instincts then towards the individual? Are we constantly going to clash? I don't think we would constantly clash, because I don't think we constantly clash at the moment. I think there are some parts of the press and some politicians that would like us to think that we constantly clash, but actually, when you look at it, we, we don't. Um, so, no, I don't think it would mean that there was a constant clash. I think there would be a tension, but I think if you believe in having a supranational system to enforce human rights against states when they put their toes out of line, then that tension is a necessary part of that. So, if, if if that forms part of the project of human rights protection, then that tension will always be there, and it's an important part of it. Thank you very much. It's a really interesting session. Can I just ask you to join me in thanking our two speakers? Thank you.